In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I will take up the chalice of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and do all manner of evil against you for my sake. The power of the Holy Spirit enabled the high priest Melchizedek to offer for the first time bread and wine on one of the ancient altars of Israel. These were outdoor altars with horns on them, which are meant to capture and hold steady animals for blood sacrifice. And under the power of the Holy Spirit, in the second phase of the Spirit, Melchizedek is able to present on that altar bread and wine and offer it. David is able to quote in the psalm, What shall I offer unto the Lord? And that psalm is used in our offering here in our sacred worship. What shall I offer unto the Lord for all that he has given unto me? I will take up the chalice of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. And the prayer goes on to say, Receive, O Most Holy Trinity, the offering. And that's under the power of the Holy Spirit in the third and final life of the Spirit. The first life of the Spirit is the divine life, which we, brothers and sisters, and our friends who are watching, the divine life of the Holy Spirit is inside the Holy Trinity. It's called perichoresis, or in Latin, circumincession, which means going inside, 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 forever and ever, incomprehensible like concepts of infinity, which we get to touch in mathematics. Math has done us a favor. Math opens for us a slight rational, just a small little ray of rational light that comes through mathematics, through concepts like pi with its unfinished number, or set theory with multiple infinities. More on that later, because I can't resist that. And inside this little rational moment, you see something that saints and the blessed, that they know not by reason, not reason alone, but by faith and through something called the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. This inner life of the Spirit in the first age is only transmissible within the Trinity itself. But in the second age of the Spirit, which is immediate in creation, This inner life is actually shared with and implanted in creation. It goes out. And the creation story in Genesis is clear on this, that there is a radiance of creative power going out into the world. And then finally, the third age of the Spirit, which we enjoy as Christians, which is the age of the coming of the Holy Ghost at Pentecost, which is the delivery unto the world of the church, the delivery of sanctity as we know it today, not just Old Testament holiness, because we have that. We have John the Baptist, our patron. The last exponent of the second age of the Spirit is John. And the absolute crossover point, the limina, if you will, another mathematical term, the in-between, is the Theotokos, the Mother of God. She's in between Old and New Testament, simultaneously in the Second Age of the Spirit, and, simul and then transferred into the Third Age of the Spirit in the Upper Room, in the Seneca, on the 50th day. And then from that comes this second radiance of the Spirit, which is holiness, in the Christian form of holiness. It's a beautiful story, isn't it? So then what about despise you? and do all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Mm. The story of sanctity in the third age is mixed. Those of you who are married, you all know about the mixed life. Everybody, everybody I've ever spoken to about marriage says that what I thought marriage was before I went into it was certainly not what it was after I got into it. There's this profound transformation of understanding that happens. Some of it's the same, but some of it is quite different. And then comes that decision to make it work, make it go, raise the children, control their litanies in church. We're having a, for our friends who are listening previously, we had quite a wonderful chorus of spontaneous 
Holy Ghost litanies going on from children under one year old, which is a sign of life in church. So I, I welcome it. I'm delighted in it. For us, in our life right now, in the third age of the Spirit, we have to make sense of how the Holy Spirit is going to work in our life. No doubt about that. Why am I raising this obvious question? Why am, I, why am I raising this obvious fact? Well, it concerns this. I believe actually we're heading into a time of crisis. Some would say, politically, we're already in crisis. Where have you been? Have you been asleep? You need to, you need to watch more news. No, I need to watch less news. I need just a little bit of news in my life. But seriously, friends and brothers and sisters, what may be, in fact, a crisis for us, I have said right from this very place, we have nothing to worry about. I need to enlarge on that later, and I will. I think we need to be prepared, and I want to enjoin on you the, really the sacred duty of preparation for crisis. I cannot enlarge on this today, but there are many signs in our world today, particularly in this capital city, that remind us that our time is fragile. The peace and safety and luxuries that we understand here in North America, they are indeed fragile. Just have a water pipe break in your house and have to call the plumber and you realize how fragile things are. Or God forbid the toilet breaks down. So I'm going very earthy here to remind us of just how fragile things can be. And then you open your checkbook or you put your credit card to work and then you pay the price. Now that's fragility. And for those who are living under the fragility of, of debts and payments, oh Lord have mercy on us. Unfortunately, in the course of time, sometimes crises come to us that are both political and spiritual. And I'm worrying, quite frankly, that this is actually about to happen to us. I'm not going to go into this today. Today is the 4th of July. It's a celebration of national virtues, such as liberty in the, under God, justice under God. Yeah, notice I said that. Liberty, justice, under God, for all, under God. This is a celebration. Later this month, we are going to have a celebration of the new martyrs of Russia. At that time, if God delivers me and allows it to happen, I want to enlarge and make good on the promise that I've just made to speak about this crisis. In preparation for that, I want to go back to 1918. And I want to illustrate two powerful gifts that come from the Holy Spirit in this third age of the Spirit. They are wisdom and counsel, or sometimes referred to as discernment. Wisdom, counsel, discernment. Three gifts. I need to work on my math. In 1918, the soon-to-be martyred Patriarch Tikhon of Moscow had an insight. 1918, Russia, Imperial Russia, under God, is no more. They have withdrawn now from the war. The crisis is coming. It's obvious. If you will go to your web pages, to your internet, search out, there's a wonderful course on the New Martyrs that's currently being taught. It's preserved on YouTube. It's taught by Father Harris. God willing, we'll have the links for that available on the website. We'll work on that. I suggest you look it up. He does an episode on this 1918 letter of Patriarch Tikhon. It is breathtaking to realize that the Patriarch had discernment, insight, and wisdom. He accurately saw what, was, what the Bolsheviks were. He read them completely correctly. Many people did not. It is amazing how many people did not read them correctly. But he was able to see into them and his condemnation of them is extremely prescient. In 1918, he is already forecasting the destruction that they're going to rot. He could see that into the future. It's amazing to him. This little Episcopal promulgation of epistle that went out. Now here's the other part of it. Blessed are you when men shall revile you. Don't think for one moment his enemies in the spirit fail to notice his remarks. And as you know, evil absolutely despises when you tell the truth about it. It gets very angry when you tell the truth about what it is. And from that moment on, he was a marked man. And Soviet authorities knew that. I believe he knew that as well. 
He did end it. Now part two, he didn't leave. Many good souls, the benefactors, the founders of this very temple are part of a mass fleeing out of Russia for safety and the preservation of the faith outside of Russia in safety. That's, that's our story. I mean, that is a story that Father Victor must tell. He didn't go. He stayed. He stayed with his seed. He stayed right to the end. You'd have to wonder. You'd have to ask him. In the resurrection, we will ask him, what led you to stay? Because you could have fled. You could have made a path to Yugoslavia, as so many did, and preserved the faith there, and still be patriarch. But he stayed, like Moses, I believe like Moses, to shepherd his people, what was left of them. Where Moses gathered his people and took them into Egypt, and they celebrated the ancient Jewish Pentecost in Sinai. He stays with his people, though they're being destroyed and scattered and broken, annihilated. And this series that I mentioned is wonderful. It shows the pictures of so many souls, the before, when they were monk so-and-so, sister so-and-so, mother, father, and their portrait dressed as accordingly, and then showing their photos when they have the placard with the number under them. They're prisoners, and they're in prison garb, and you can see the beating on them, that the wearing down of them, and these souls are being destroyed and crushed. What shall I offer unto the Lord for all that he has given unto me? That's a story that has to be told when we come to the new martyrs. As you can tell, I'm a fan of the new martyrs. I really take a lot from their witness. And I want you to take from this message the power of discernment. It comes from the Holy Ghost. I'm simply reminding you of it. You'll be needing it. We'll need it. Take from this message the wisdom of the Holy Ghost because you're going to need it. You always have needed it. We're going to need it more. And then finally, the power of discernment, the power of counsel and discernment, rather. What is it made of? Let me conclude with this. Discernment is a beautiful gift because it's both natural in us, it comes through reason, and it's also supernatural in us. It's imparted into us by grace, by this indwelling that I mentioned to you. Discernment is one of the most powerful signs that the inner perichoresis, circumcession, the inner language of the Trinity in the first age is actually now working in the third age in us when we discern correctly, when we stand our ground in holiness and don't run away, or when we have to pick up our bags and leave everything behind and go to Yugoslavia or Harvard or San Francisco or New York with nothing but rags in your bags to save the faith. That's also from discernment. That's wisdom, discernment, and counsel at work. May it come to us, and may we not have to suffer. God have mercy. The blessings of the Lord be upon you through his grace and love towards mankind, always, now, and ever, and unto the ages of ages.